Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I'm glad that on today I can still confess that Jesus, he is Lord over me. But I'm not ashamed to tell you I am in love with Jesus. He supplies every one of my needs. I'm praying today that Jesus also your Lord. That you're in love with Jesus. That will make Jesus be our Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. If you believe that your God is God, could you look at somebody, smile at them, and tell them it's still Jesus time? It's still Jesus time. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You wouldn't be seated. We will be as brief as the Holy Ghost will allow today. I thank Jesus for being good to you, whether you know it or not. For looking past your faults and continue to supply every single one of your needs. The Bible says uh, that we wake up in the morning because he thought about us. It is good to know that in spite of what you've done, in spite of who you are, Jesus still smiled on you today. And this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Open your Bibles. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 6. I want to read uh, all but one of the verses. Verses 1 through 19. And I'll be as brief as the Holy Ghost will allow. I think that uh, because we serve the Almighty God, because we serve the Rock of Ages, because we serve the Rose of Sharon, because we serve the Everlasting Father, because the God that we serve is King of Kings and He is Lord of Lords, that means He does not error. There is no fault in Him. If He said it, He will bring it to pass. So we believe in wholeheartedly that he can't make mistakes, but that he's already, already. in full control. Yeah. Hebrews chapter number 6, verses 1 through verse 19, prayerfully consider it with me. In the name of Jesus, the Bible reads, Therefore, leaving the principle of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of doctrines of baptisms and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, verse 5, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. I'm at verse number seven now. Uh, for the earth will, uh, which drinketh in the rain, and it cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But they which bear thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Verse number nine. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and the things that accompany salvation, though we speak, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. That by two immutable, uh, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Verse number 16, for men verily swear by, by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God will more abundantly show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. I'm going to read 17 again. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation. We have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Verse 19, last one. Which hope we have as an anchor for our soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you would turn to someone near to you and just announce these words to them, done complaining. 
Non-complaint. Non-complaint. Non Finished. It's complete. It is over. It is satisfied. The condition has been met. I am done complaining. He speaks in Hebrews 6, the writer in Hebrews 6, and he speaks, and I wanted to read uh, the uh, uh, almost the completeness of the chapter because it says something about uh, not only uh, spiritual maturity, but it says something about having uh, some understanding of how Jesus is. And so he said, therefore, leaving the, the principles of doctrine of Christ and going on to perfection and laying and, and not laying again the foundation of repentance and dead works, he keeps going on to them about the stuff that they do uh, because they keep on doing the stuff that they do well over again. Uh, let me say, uh, so uh, if you have received it, uh, then you should already have it. And so he said, therefore, what we're doing is now is time to transition to the next level. Everything I have received, I already have. And so if you're building, uh, what happens is everything you receive first, that's called foundation. And then after that, you build upon it. And he said, therefore, we're leaving all the other stuff because we have to get bigger than that, because we have to get more mature than that. He said, if so, that you understand Jesus, you receive the Holy Ghost, you didn't have these spiritual gifts, and you know about baptism, you know how Jesus died, you understand all these things. He says now uh, you have to move on to the next thing. So here's, uh, here's the indictment on us, that the next thing for us is to find patience in Jesus. Because uh, we don't understand what it means to be patient. Oftentimes, we allow ourselves to be moved into a place of impatience. And I can prove to you through the scripture that our God does not operate in impatience. Uh -oh. That's just not who he is. James said that you got to ask with nothing wavering. Because he that wavers can hope to receive nothing of the Lord. He doesn't operate in that kind of impatience. What we have here is, is that patience by definition it means to endure without complaining that's why this is always a work in progress because I know how to go through stuff but sometimes you go through and there's so much complaining that they can't see that Jesus is the one holding you up because there's so much complaint intermingled in uh, what it is that you're going through. And then the writer here in Hebrews chapter 6 says that that's a sign of spiritual immaturity. And that you're still going back to the other stuff. You'll start talking about what he did. But he said when you understand who he is, then you realize that if he said it, he got to do it. So he said, this is what we have, the problem that we have. He said, I am persuaded better things of you that you're not of them who crucify him afresh. And, and with that, uh, we've oftentimes have uh, thought that that meant that somehow that you're doing something uh, that Jesus didn't pay for. Here's what it means to crucify Jesus afresh. It means to make the offering of his sacrifice invalid. It means to simply mean that he didn't pay for what he paid for. He says this. This ain't about uh, how you just said it. Of course, sin, he paid for that. But it's some other stuff he paid for, too. He paid for your joy. He paid for your peace. He paid for your strength. All these things Jesus paid for. And he said, if we don't walk in what Jesus pays, paid for, then we crucify him afresh. If Jesus still has to pay for what the blood has already covered, then we don't understand what's in the blood covenant. If Jesus still got to work to get your joy, then what joy did he already pay for? If he's still trying to work out your pieces right there in the Bible, we read it together, then what piece did he just abroad shed for you? If he's still trying to put together how to do it, every time Jesus got to shed more blood, every time he got to pour out more peace, every time he got to release new joy, what did he already pay for? What's already in the covenant? So when he starts talking about the covenant, he said, now there's some stuff that's in the covenant that don't match up with what's in your living, and that's when patience comes in. Because Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. See, there's something in the covenant that got to already cover what's in your living. He said, but be of good cheer. But being that it cancels out what's already in the world. So you're uh, complaining because you're upset by what's in the world. But Jesus said that's not where your cheer comes from. Your cheer is because even though you're in the world, you're covered by the covenant. Because Jesus already paid for it. Because his blood has already been shed for it. And he said, therefore, uh, be of good cheer for I have already overcome everything.
That's the covenant. That's what he's paid for. That's what's already sealed. And that's what he's already delivered to us. And now, so when we got stuff that's not in the covenant, uh, when we behave like we have not received the covenant, when we act like we don't know what Jesus paid for, uh -oh. then he said, that's when we, he said, for him who has been in life, for him who has received the Holy Ghost, for him uh, to be restored after he knows how good Jesus is. And so what what you find out is that this is this is the hard part about moving into this other level of maturity. And I'll, we'll go even further. I'll move quicker, but we'll go even further. And he'll, he'll tell you that when you start moving into this, this can't do nothing but make you better. And so when we start moving into this, it's really a declaration that not only do I got Jesus, not only do I love him, but I got to get better. And so when you start acting like the covenant ain't real, when you start acting like every time your boat gets shaking, it's going to fall all to pieces, it simply just means you don't know who you on the boat with. And when you know who you on the boat with, then even though it shakes, even though it starts rattling sometimes, you'll start declaring, I'm on the boat with Jesus, and I'm underneath the word. And the word said we're going all the way to the other side, so it can rattle, pieces of the wood can fly off, people can jump overboard, but my mind is made up. Or as the writer said in Hebrews 6, he said that we have now this kind of covenant with Jesus and now our souls are anchored. Anchoring don't stop uh, stuff from shaking all while. It just means I ain't going nowhere. So now uh, when we have uh, a confession uh, that's made out of our mouths, it comes from our heart. We know this from the Bible. And Jesus said out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We understand that from Jesus. And so you got to understand that when it is you have a mouth condition, it means you really got a heart condition. Yes. Well, well, well. That nobody just has a mouth condition. Mm. Oh, my mouth is messed up. Yes, it is. But because <laughs> your heart is messed up. Well. The prophet Isaiah said uh, that I come from uh, people with messed up talk. I come from a long line of messed up people. And he said, and my mouth also is messed up. But he wasn't talking about just his mouth. He said, Jesus, if you're going to use me, some men me don't know how to talk right. I need you first to work on me. And so the Bible used a symbolism about his mouth, but it's talking about he had something wrong with the way he thought. Something wrong with the way he lived. Every time uh, trouble came, he forgot who his God was. And so when we start talking about this kind of covenant that we received, and he goes on to talk about Abraham, and he said when he swore the promise to Abraham, because Abraham was already good, but he wasn't already blessed. I mean, he was okay. He was living all right. He was doing all right. The Bible said that uh, when Abraham was called of God to leave his father's tent, he already had a place to live. Yeah. His father already had money. And then he heard the word of God tell him, go out into the wilderness. I, I don't want you to live in the tent. I want to build you a nation. Yeah. And so Abraham then went out on the word of God, got to another place in his life, and and then he heard a word again from God to Abraham, now, I need you to do something for me. I need you to give up your gift. I need you to offer to me the thing that you love most. He asked him about his son. And in that time, that Abraham offered up his son. That's when uh, God then said to Abraham, I know now I can trust you with anything. Here's the thing that we have. Here's my point of making and telling you that story uh, that the blessing was released after then the patient had been applied and so because we never apply patience we never receive the blessing let me get back to the scripture Hebrew chapter number 6 all you have need of is patience yeah. that after you've done the will of God you might receive the promise. Let me tell you what's been really messing you up. Yes, you know the Bible. Yes, you know the word. Yes, you know how to shout and dance. Yes, you know how to talk to people about Jesus. However, you don't know how to hold on. He said, all you have need of is patience. This here in Hebrews 6 is literally preaching to the church. He tell them, now the only problem you got, y'all do everything good. Y'all know all about Jesus. Y'all know how excellent he is. But then when stuff starts getting a little bit rough. The reason why that uh, conversation is not as it should be. James said that uh, confess, uh, uh, confess your faults one to another and pray ye one for another that ye might be healed. For the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. You know that scripture, you know it. Then why don't we like talking to each other? I'll say it to you again right there in the Bible. He said, uh, confess your faults one to another. 
pray ye one for, he said, this is how you get better. Pray ye one for another that ye might be healed. For the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. So I'm asking you again, why don't we want to talk to each other? The answer is simple, because each one of us then that are sick, but it's not that we're sick, that's not what we don't want to talk to each other. The reason why we don't want to talk to each other, because we don't want to hear each other complain. Oh, yeah. Come on, come on. Oh my Jesus, when we can admit then that there's flesh, flesh is messed up. When you put the whole Jesus on, you don't got to make no kind of resting place for the flesh. You ain't got to make, leave no provision for the flesh. All I'm saying is, I'm not coming against you. I'm just saying that all of our flesh is messed up. But if we're going to move to the other level, we got to let Jesus do something with this patience thing. So there's times that we should have been enduring uh, but then it found us out. Take the Apostle Paul, for instance. You know about the thorn in his flesh. We talk about it all the time. But the thorn in his flesh found him out that he had some patience issues. And so he did the same thing that I would do, the same thing that you did, because he's a praying man. He prayed hard. He prayed harder because, again, he knows Jesus. He knows prayer changes things. He knows that Jesus is able. So he just prayed more. He did the same thing I would do. Maybe I'm not praying the right way, so he prayed different. Uh -huh. Maybe I'm not praying long enough, so he prayed longer. Yeah. And then Jesus responds to him about the covenant, the content, and the value of it. He says to him, my grace is sufficient unto thee, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now, in that, Jesus tells him, the thing that you need, you've already been covered for. And then, Paul says, now knowing that, I can rejoice in this thing I'm going through. He said, now knowing that, this thorn ain't gonna stop me from holding on to my glory in Jesus. So we've been blocked and stopped and over and over again, and I guess the thing that really causes us, and he talked about leaving and principles and doctrine, all these other things. He's talked about that you can get to a place really uh, where you know about Jesus, but you really have no desire to get better. Like, um, for instance, you didn't just start complaining. That you understand that how healing works, you know that Jesus is the healer. You know that the blood that Jesus shed, uh, as a matter of fact, to be exact, the Bible said the stripes that he bore on his back paid for our healing. And you believe that, but sometimes while you're in the middle of your sickness, you don't talk healing because you lose patience. And I'm not telling you it's a little thing. If it was a little thing, it wouldn't be uh, something that you have to work on. If it was a little thing, you would already have it mastered. But what happens is, is that sometimes things go on longer than what you had intended. If Jesus is your healer and you're sick, but you have been sick for five years, when does he stop being your healer? See, this is real stuff here. If Jesus is your healer, but you've been going to the doctor every day faithfully for the last 15, 20 years, when does he stop being your healer? Jesus is your healer, but you had it, your mama had it, your children had it. When does he stop being your healer? But the writer says it's easy for us to misplace the value that is in Jesus. It's easy for us to become impatient. And I tell you, though, especially when you expecting that Jesus would do it now. So he speaks this to people who understand something about righteousness because righteous people believe they deserve everything. everything. And so anytime it doesn't come quick enough, we'll do just like Paul did. We're going to pray for Jesus. You must in here. Your meek and lowly servant is in need of your care. The one who prays to you all the time because we understand that Jesus hears our cry, but sometimes we don't understand patience. So he says here in Hebrews 6, after you've done the will of God, after you stand on who Jesus is, after you're underneath the blood, all you have to do after that is just be patient. Simply don't change your mind. James said in chapter number five uh, that you can't be double-minded, that you can't be tossed to and fro, that you got to have your mind already fixed. What he says that? that you got to have this thing already made up. This is James five, uh, verse two. Count it all joy. James wanted to count it all joy. When you fall into divers' temptation. 
knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire and wanting for nothing. You're talking about getting better. Oh, my Jesus. James says, count it all joy. When you fall in, there's a whole different kind of this covenant talk now. This is blessings on blessings. Multiplying on multiplying. You want to talk about the blessing, but you don't want to talk about the patience. James said, count it all joy. When you fall in the dive of temptation. James said, I look at it different. When I see trouble my way, I know something's about to happen. I realize the covenant I'm under. I know the blood I've been sealed with. Count it all joy. When you fall in the dive of temptation. He said, because knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The James has the same thing that Paul says. In Romans 8 and 28, he's simply saying, you don't want to mess around and get somebody who hooked up with Jesus in the right position. Oh, let me say it like Jesus said. He said, if I be lifted up above the earth, so you think that I'm going through trouble, but if you ever get me in the right position, I'll draw all men unto me. James said that sometimes this trouble comes and you think trouble is for overwhelming, but be of good cheer. Jesus already paid the price. The only reason why you can count a joy because you know what Jesus does with trouble. What I'm saying to you, let me say it to you clearly so you understand. 2016, you got the nerve to be alive. And you don't know how Jesus works yet. You got the nerve to still be moving under your own accord. And you don't know how good Jesus is yet. He said, now you should see stuff coming and count it all joy. He said, now you should be able to thank him in everything. For this is the will of God concerning us. But if we don't move forward into it, we'll never be able to do it, and you'll still be doing the same stuff you were doing. Just talked a minute ago, and, you, and what you realize is that even us that love Jesus, sometimes we just got to say that. I just spent too much time wasting time. And I'm tired of just going through the motion. I ain't got no more, I ain't got no more game plan left in me. I, I need him too much. His things are getting too real around me. I, I need his word too much. I need the evidence of him in my life. I need his presence in my living. I need Jesus. I'm not saying I got everything all together. I'm saying what, what the same thing Paul said. There's one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for those things which are before. He said, I got to keep pressing toward the more. I know what I'm going after. I know what I need. That I need Jesus in my life. That if you are, uh, if you are content to stay the same, and I don't want to go through, but there's a, a litany, literally a, a whole uh, line of people who are willing to not let Jesus change you. And sometimes you believe that you staying the same is effective, but it's not. You think that it's okay, but it's not. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and do it not, to him it is a sin. You say, well, Jesus blessed me. Jesus spoke a parable of a man who got one talent took it and did nothing with it. It's not good for you just to stay the same. You got to get better than this. Paul said this one thing I do, he's making, he's making his affirmation and telling you, now I know I messed up some stuff yesterday. I ain't telling you I've always been right. All I'm telling you is I'm in love with Jesus. I know I'm covered by the blood. I know my Redeemer liveth. I know Jesus got all power. He said, all I'm telling you is I'm going after Jesus. You can look at me funny if you want to. All I'm telling you is I need him in my life. Oh, see, I like when people get real with you. I ain't got to tell you I prayed right all the time. I ain't been to all the services. But I know who I'm in love with. I know who paid the price. Because Jesus is who he is. Now those who are now uh, in faith, in patience.
patience. They can follow in agreement those who are in faith in patience until what? Until until what Jesus said comes to pass, come to pass. I'll say it to you more clearly. He's saying that I, I'm now stepping out a little bit further and, and because I'm stepping out a little further and moving into my patience and standing on the word of Jesus, I no longer can just agree with everything. It's just my, I mean, because before just being in a, in a needy place, if, if you were praying, anybody praying, everybody, I want everybody praying, unify. Join hands together and pray for me. But now I don't want everybody praying. Not because it's going to hurt me, just because it ain't going to help me. I don't want anybody praying for me that ain't believing with me. Oh my Jesus. Why even waste your time? I'm free to you even right now. If you don't believe Jesus can do it for me, you ain't got to pray for me no more. If you don't believe he can fix it, you ain't got to pray with me no more. I want somebody who knows that Jesus is able. Somebody who's tasted that the Lord is gracious. David said the humble shall hear my testimony and get glad about it. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with people praying for you. Don't go and start saying, oh, well, don't pray for me because you don't know how. To, that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh -huh. I'm just saying, if you can't believe with me, I don't need your prayer. Wow. Say, everybody needs prayer. No, I don't just need prayer. I need somebody who knows that my Savior is able. You probably got other stuff you need to pray for. Pray for somebody else. <laughs> But if you want to pray for me, I don't have no problem with it, but you just got to believe Jesus can do it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you, you find me sick and come by my bedside, I don't want you looking over me, looking to see if you can find a healer. But if you're going to come believe in Jesus with me, I want you to believe that you already know. That you can just declare in the name of Jesus. Paul said, You notice I ain't come with all them fancy words. He said, I know all kind of words, but I know that there's power in the name. He said, Notice I ain't try to, I ain't try to impress you with how much I know. I came to you knowing nothing but Jesus and him crucified. It is hard for us to do. It is hard for us to do what we don't have the ability, or better yet, not the ability, but the practice of. God is not mocked with a man's soul that shall he also reap. Uh, that has to do with uh, not only sowing and reaping, but it has to do with daily living, what you're in the practice of. If you're not in the practice of being patient, then every time uh, something happens, your impatience will find you out. That's what's wrong with people even right now. I gave $2 25 years ago. Where is my harvest? See, what happens is, is that we want to have connection, but not covenant. Amen. And when you have covenant, it means that you ain't got to worry about Jesus and take no thought. Seek ye first. Oh, y'all not even hear what I'm saying? He said the difference between having connection and covenant is connection means I heard in the Bible this is how you work. But covenant means Jesus, I'm hooked up with you, whatever your will is. Jesus said, for it's the Father's good pleasure. That's how the covenant works. It means that sometimes it gets shaky. 
It means sometimes I got a little and sometimes I got a little less, but I still got Jesus. It means maybe I'm working now, maybe next week I'm not, but I'm still covered by the blood. That's right, that's right. It means that Jesus already satisfied my condition before it's ever even a condition. And not only that, but here's the other part about the blessing. He said the, that the covenant that he swore with Abraham, that he said in blessing thou bless thee, in multiplying thou multiply thee. He came from a blessing and said, I'm going to bless you again. I'm going to bless you to a whole nother level. Now Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus having a better covenant based on better promises. Oh, that's what the Bible said. Jesus had a better covenant because it's based or established on better promises. What I'm saying is the stuff that Jesus is giving out uh -huh. is better than the stuff Abraham received. Yeah. If you thought Abraham was blessed, on, imagine what happens if you're in covenant with Jesus. Here's the hard part about it. It's hard to break something that we have made habit in our lives. What I'm saying is when you do it every day, when you sow to the flesh and you reap back, corruption to the flesh that at some point in time you gotta stop yourself get a hold of yourself you gotta change what it is you're sowing if you ever gonna change what it is you're reaping now it's easy for you to want better but if you want better you're gonna have to do better paul didn't just cry out when he heard jesus talk he said hold on i'm changing everything i'm gonna praise right here i'm gonna thank him right here let me tell you this is the this is the hard part for us that as good as Jesus has been to you, you still think as far as he brought you, as many times he healed you, blessed you, as many times he restored you, given you joy, brought you peace, brought you into safety, kept you in the palm of his hand. As many times that Jesus has touched your life, you think that somebody else now should have to cheer you up? You got this kind of company. And you mad because you think somebody else got a better blessing? Jesus has been to you right there, Hebrews 6, as good as he been. He said, I'm persuaded better things. He said, in other words, I believe you ought to know better. There's some people that get caught up in the game, but I believe you know better than that. I mean, as good as he's been to you. Maybe somebody who we only have here, but you should have been dead. Maybe somebody who we only have brought out, but you know you already were crazy. Jesus has been good to you. Maybe somebody who's not sure who touched him. Well, but you know it was Jesus. Do you know why? You know it was Jesus. Because what had you wouldn't let you go. Because the thing that had control over your life was the real thing. But then one stronger than him came and bound him up. And so now you can think. The Jesus is so the covenant is so good. The covenant is so good that I can tell you I'm free and I ain't got a whisper. I can tell you I've been changed and I ain't got to write on no secret note. I know it was Jesus. I know he paid the price. And Paul said, I ain't trying to say I'm altogether perfect. I'm just saying I know what's in the covenant. That I understand what I'm going after. I know that Jesus has paid the price for me. James chapter 5, he said, uh, notice or note that we count them happy that endure. Oh, my Jesus. So uh, he's now saying that in the covenant, uh, there is a changeover because you think that the happiness that people have is coming from some other source. But the only way you can be happy is if you are locked in to the covenant. And if you locked in to the covenant or covered by the blood of Jesus, then the Bible said we count them happy. Then they said, consider the patience of Job. He said that after Job endured, he found 
that the Lord was uh, piteous, merciful, that he was gracious, that what he found out uh, when he tried Jesus was that not only does Jesus do what he said he's going to do, but Jesus is good to me. Yes, he is. See, you can't just be what you say. It got to be how you live. He said what he found out is, is that even while people are talking about you, Jesus is still good. Yes, he is. Even while you're going through a sickness, Jesus is still good. You lost a few dollars, but Jesus is still good. You lost a few friends, but Jesus is still good. said was Job understood. He said, I know that even though I'm going through my circumstance, my God is faithful. The Bible said he is faithful, he did promise. That's what we believe. That's what we understand. It's not because I'm not having real trouble. It's not because it ain't real stuff bothering me. It's just because his grace is sufficient. It's just because I'm covered by the word. It's because I'm sealed until the day of redemption. And so it's hard to have someone who has covenant but still is in an impatient spirit. Amen. That if you want to hear some real complaining, all you have to do is come into a church building. And the reason why is because we think that complaining is rejoicing. And so we will give you 15 minutes of complaining and then 15 seconds of what we call rejoicing. Because we don't understand what real rejoicing is. Here's what real rejoicing is. Job, uh, in a matter of moments, lost his, uh, his, his houses, his land, lost his cattle and then all of his children. And they came to Job and said, Job, everything you have everything. is gone. All oh, just rest on that for a moment. They came to Job and said, Job, everything you have, gone. And Job, the Bible says, tore his clothes off, fell down on his face and said, naked came out uh -oh. out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Listen then, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hebrews 6 says, he'll bless you for his name's sake. Job said, Jesus is still good to me. The hard part for us is that there's been times where we ain't done it. And so your praise was, the house, it fell apart. Yeah. All the money it left and all the children, they died. And, and instead of us, instead of us having patience, we walk in sorrow and we want pity. And so it really becomes a question of whose story is the worst and not who God is the best. But the truth is Jesus is better than how we make him appear. Right. Elijah being confident there at Mount Carmel, I'm just about finished, that his God was the one and true God. He said, I'm so confident, I can wait right here. Do everything y'all gonna do. I'm gonna give y'all all the chance you need. The scripture said they were making offerings, sacrifices. They started making live, live sacrifices. Right there while Elijah just sat and waited. And he finally asked him, are you finished? Well, well. He said, I'm going to show you the real God that, that can show you fire. That can show up just because he is. And so after they done all that, I mean, he waited. The scripture said they were, they were doing this sacrificing from sun up till late in the day. Not only did he let them go, he let them go to the Bible said they were exhausted. Not they did everything they could do. They didn't have no more energy. They were fanning, waving, jumping, all kind of stuff. And Elijah said, when you're done now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how my God is. I ain't got to go through all that shenanigans. All I got to do is call them. 
So he then prayed near the altar. And he said, so they know that you are the only God. I need you to send some fire. But here's the thing, not just that kind of confidence. This is the, I guess, the part the Bible says he, he dumped seven buckets of water. Uh, this seems ridiculous to me, but after they were done with the altar, the stones, uh, no way to make a fire, just to show that his God was God, not that he needed to prove it, but he was just confident that he was underneath the word that could not be changed. Or as Hebrews 6 said, immutable. So he dumps these buckets of water over the stones. And so then the Bible said when the fire showed up, it did not only burn the offering and the water, but it burned the stones. I'll say it to you again. When his fire showed up, he ain't got to worry about the water being in the way, the people being in the way, the stone being in the way. He ain't got to worry about the right day or the right time. All he knows is that his God has the real power. If you ever met Jesus, here's the thing. You are complaining, worried about some other stuff in the way. You think he worked. The doctor can't get in the way. The medicine ain't in the way. The diagnosis ain't in the way. People talking about you ain't in the way. The situation ain't in the way. He's able. That he's so able that Jesus, Jesus told one Simon Peter, he said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me go a step further and remind you uh, that when you are under this kind of covenant, the devil can't do nothing about it. He can't do anything about it. That means that even while he's huffing and puffing, all you gotta do is just wait. Even while he walking about as a roaring lion, all you gotta do is put your trust in Jesus. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He can't win. But you worry that it won't work out. But he says, how can it not work out if Jesus said The Bible says, even in the book of Numbers, that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Shall he say it? and not do it. Shall he speak it and not make it good? The Jesus has never, ever, ever broken his word. It's impossible. He said that not only that, uh, the writer in Hebrew said, this is the confidence I have by this immutable rule that God can't lie. That Paul writes and said that our God is a uh, the, the, the Jesus we preach to you, he's never been yay and nay. He's always been yay. Yeah. The Paul said, notice when we came and preached Jesus to you, we did never preach Jesus yay and nay. He's always yay. Meaning he don't change. He don't flip. He's not sometime. He said he's always yay. He said, and the promises that are in Jesus are yay. And the promises that are in Jesus are Amen. amen. The word is good. The promises are good. But in order to have patience, the other thing is you got to trust him. When you move from patience because of lack of trust, you just move into panic. And you ought to be past panicking now. I mean, I'm not saying you didn't panic before, but Jesus has been good to you. You say, but you don't understand, I'm still sick. I say, you don't understand, you're still alive. Jesus has been good to you. And if we were to talk about real blessings, how about this for a blessing for you? What if somebody who should have died in the 80s is still living in 2016? I call that a blessing. have you been in a place and bullets flying around you but here you are still alive I mean I call that a blessing how many of you? how many 
end of Europe. Release your children to the unknown, but somehow they found their way back home now. Right. Jesus has been good to you. And I'm trying to move that I won't complain till I can't complain. Right. That you no longer have underneath this covenant that we read about, uh, you no longer have the legal uh, merit to be able to complain. That if you're underneath this covenant, uh, then all you got to do is understand that, that he's not forgetful. That he doesn't forget your labor of love. That if you can't mess up doing what Jesus said. That you can't go wrong living for Jesus. Under this covenant, complaining ain't allowed. Now, of course, you can't complain. But the reason why you don't complain is because I'm underneath another covenant. And James said that when you realize you're underneath the another, uh, this other covenant counted on joy. Remember when you were praying for trouble to stop, and now, uh, and now in your wisdom, you realize trouble ain't gonna never stop. So what you gonna do with the trouble? Remember you said, "Oh, just please make it stop." If they just leave me alone, <laughs> the world will never leave you alone. As long as you're in the world, now I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. You'll have tribulation. Trouble, that is. As long as you're here, as long as you're in the world, there will be tribulation. But be of good cheer. That's the covenant. Until you can count your trouble as joy. Because you're always going to have trouble. The thing you don't always have is joy. That's right. That's right. All, every day you got trouble. Bible confirms that we have the authority to do this one thing that often we don't do enough. And it's all right because it's hard for you to get a hold of yourself, but sometimes you got to rebuke yourself. Sometimes we have to then understand uh, that the behavior that we've been living in is not the behavior that is profitable for us. In other words, this ain't how you live in the blessing. That when you start knowing who you are, or understanding the covenant, or understanding the blessing, here's what it says to you. Sometimes you don't do things not because you wouldn't do them, you're just too blessed to have to do them. I mean, I can worry about how it's going to turn out, but Jesus knows the end from the beginning. I'm too blessed to have to worry about it. I can just cast my kids. Do you believe anything that Jesus said? If you believe him, some point in time, you're going to have to trust him. I'm not saying you don't slip. That's why you got to be able to rebuke yourself. You've been slipping for too long. Now you're just out of control. All you have need of is patience. You mean to say the only thing that's blocking you, the only reason why you can't see how blessed it is to walk with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ it's because you don't have this patience. All you have need of. All right. You're willing to do everything else. 